Hello, everyone. I want to thank you for taking the time to be here. And I always uh, hope that you have uh, taken the time to do two things, to read through the text that I'm going to deal with tonight, which is basically 2 Corinthians chapter 3 through part of chapter 5. And of course, uh, done some a little study yourself from the, your study Bible and have prayed both for me and for you. I mean, this this is a spiritual event. And we are in a spiritual conflict for the hearts and minds of human beings. So this information is important not only for believers, but for unbelievers. And if, if any are, are listening, we just hope the Holy Spirit will open their hearts and minds. I'm really excited about tonight as I have gone through this. It takes me several days to go back through my notes. I, I wrote this commentary decades ago in some of these books. And so I'm trying to edit them as I go through and if what I have written doesn't make sense to me, then I tried to clarify it. And I've also tried, you'll get a new set of notes online in about a month. I'm also trying to document some of the places uh, from popular books, more less technical books, where if someone is looking for more information on this verse or this subject, they can they can find books that I trust and and maybe look further and get other evangelical scholars' opinion on this or that. Now, remember, we're in a large parenthesis. Uh, it runs from chapter 2, verse 14, through chapter 7, verse, some say 7, 1, some say 7, 5. It looks to me like we're going to pick up with Titus and his, his report to Paul in chapter 7, verse 5. Now, this parenthesis is just Paul getting caught off subject. I mean, his mind ran toward other subjects. And as I have, through the years, preached a whole lot out of Second Corinthians, I just thank God that his mind wandered because some of the most wonderful uh, passages and uh, promises and theology is found in this parenthesis. Now, chapter three is very, very much like the book of Hebrews. We're going to compare the old covenant with the new covenant. We're going to compare performance Christianity with the new covenant of internal um, non-performance based on God's performance in Christ, Christianity. Now, I have a special topic called, it's, it's basically the outline of the book of Hebrews, and it's called the superiority of the new covenant over the Mosaic covenant. I hope you will look at that special topic sometime after this lesson. I've also done a special topic on Paul's view of the Mosaic law. And I get a lot of questions from time to time about what is the relationship to the old covenant to the Christian? I think it's a really good question, and I hope you will look at, at, at what Paul says. He kind of gives two sides to it. In one sense, it's dead as relates to salvation. In another sense, it's eternally relevant because it's inspired for God's will of how humans ought to treat each other in society. So it's one of these both and paradoxes that are so common in Eastern literature and particularly in the New Testament. OK, well, with that in mind, then let's look, if we could, at this uh, opening section. I usually call it contextual insights. And of course, what I try to do is give the, the meat of the whole chapter and then come back to the word and phrase study, which is the detailed exegesis. So if you look at number B, it says this chapter uses the term spirit. It's highly ambiguous. Now, what I've tried to do there is to, to say to you, this, of course, is the Greek word pneuma. And it's used in several ways in the Bible. And it, it often depends if it has the article or not. Sometimes it's referring to the third person of the Trinity. And sometimes it's referring to the spiritual aspect of human beings. Sometimes there's a purposeful ambiguity when it comes to believers who we are what we are in Christ because of the Spirit's help. So there's this purposeful am ambiguity that we come about. I really think that what this is going to pick up on is the, the only reference in the Old Testament to the new covenant, which should have shocked any Jew, is Jeremiah 31 verses 31 through 34. And what it basically says is there's going to be an internal uh, law instead of an external law. Now, this, this chapter is going to play on that. 
It's going to play on what happened in Exodus when the Bible says that God wrote these tablets with his own finger. And then what happens in the new covenant when the Holy Spirit, if you want what the Holy Spirit does, I think John 16, 8 through about 16, really gives a sequence of the job of the Holy Spirit for the New Testament. So it, it's a play on that, I think. And, and that's important. Another word that there's a real play on is the word namas or law. And you can see that under number C. Now, if you'll notice there, I've got several points and I want to point those out. There is a contrast between the law bringing wrath, look at number one, and the law being spiritually good. Now, this is this Roman seven. And I've added several more references there that I, that I have found in both Romans seven and first Timothy one, eight. The law is good. The problem is not the law. The problem is the human's ability to keep the law. Now, you notice there's a contrast, and I've given you several different passages there. This contrast between it's, 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 a, it's a curse, it's a death sentence, the old covenant, the soul that sins that will surely die. Everybody has sinned. The Old Testament is a death sentence. That's why Galatians 3.13 says, he delivered us from the curse. Well, what was that curse? It was the Mosaic law because nobody could. So there's this contrast. Now, number four is Paul's going to have a play between Paul's use of Abraham and Moses. Now, this is the ideal of faith and law. And, and we're going we're gonna to see that over and over. I mentioned a book there, and I, I don't know if you ever read much, but if you do, uh, for me, Paul is just wonderful. I preach mostly out of Paul. I mean, uh, Jesus, he overwhelms me in the things he says. I, I don't know how to in, interpret them or implement them. Paul is a little more along the way, I think. He gives examples and illustrations and, and does it in a logical presentation. So Paul has just been such a blessing to me. And my favorite book on the Apostle Paul is by James Stewart. And it's called A Man in Christ. I've given you a quote there. If that quote seems really good to you, I hope you'll think about getting that book. It should be available in a local library. Now, if you look at number D for a minute, Paul uses several images or metaphors of things in the, in the Christian life that we're going to see used over and over in this chapter. So let me cover those now. The first one is the word letter. Now, he's going to make a play on letter being a letter of recommendation, and I'll explain that when I get into the text. And then he's going to say the church at Corinth is Paul's letter of recommendation. The very fact the church exists says Paul's an apostle, a faithful apostle. And then finally, he's going to use this idea going back to, I believe it's Exodus 34, about the tablets of stone, the letters on the tablet. Now, he's also going to mention the old and new covenants. He's going to talk about the written versus the spiritual. The written kills, but the spiritual gives life. So there's going to be a real play. Now, the third word that he's going to play on is the word veil. And this is going back to when Moses came down from the mountain, his face glowed because he was in the presence of God. So this veil did two things. The people were afraid because Moses face glowed. So he veiled his face so they wouldn't be afraid. But number two, the, the glory faded after a while. So he put a veil on his face so they wouldn't know the glory was fading. Now, that is some of the play here. Now, what's interesting to me is he's going to say this is what Moses did. Then he's going to say this is what the Jews of Paul's day has happened to them. They have a veil over their mind that God gave them. God, God is the one that hardened them. They can't see until the veil is removed. Now, they even, he says, the Jews of his day. Now, I want to remind you, there's a group of Jews from Palestine that have come to Corinth and are attacking Paul. And that's, that's the background to him using this. And finally, there's a veil on all human beings. And unless the Holy Spirit opens, illumines, uh, energizes our spiritual understanding, the Bible is just a dead book. And so all of these plays on words, plays on Old Testament texts, is what makes this chapter wonderful, but a little bit confusing if you just open the Bible and read it. 
I want to remind you that all of the New Testament books are what we call occasional documents. There's a need in the church. There's a problem in the church. There's a crisis in the church. And an inspired apostle wrote to that need. But trying to read the New Testament is like listening to one half of a phone conversation. Now, what that means is the other half comes from the historical setting of the original inspired author. So we've got to ask the W questions. Who, what, when, where, why? To try to understand the images, the allusions, the Old Testament echoes that Paul is using to address this current current problem. Okay, let's go then, if we could, at chapter 3, verse 1, and start looking at some of these uh, uh, exegetical points. First, I would say the question here in verse 1 expects a no answer, which means there's a textual aspect. Paul asked a question, but the answer was going to be no. Now, this idea of commend yourself, um, this is the, Paul is saying, I have to, I, I, the one who brought the gospel to you, I, who started this church, I have to commend myself to you because of your believing what these false teachers said. I think Paul was appalled. It's what happened to this church. Now, this letter of recommendations, there are some in the New Testament. I have done a special topic called letters of recommendation. Uh, uh, Phoebe, Romans 16, other places, Timothy, Titus, Silas. The early church had a problem. All of the Motel 6s of that day were, were houses of ill repute. Um, no Christian itinerant leader, preacher, prophet could stay in those kind of places. So the church had to open the homes of its members. But the church needed to know these were true people of God, true ministers, so these letters of recommendation from one church to another allowed that and showed who was trustworthy and, and who was not. Now, in verse two, you see where Paul says, you don't need I don't need a letter of recommendation to you. <laughs> and note, when it says in verse two, by all men. Now, you know, this is what we call a hyperbole. This is a purpose for overstatement for emphasis. Now, when people say I just take the Bible literally. The problem with that is the Bible is normal human language. It has all kinds of imagery and figures of speech, and particularly Eastern literature, which does overstatements and parables and paradoxes. And Western people tend to really understand the, the way that this truth is presented. You are a letter of Christ. And um, I, I put a little note here. I wanted to read it to you. Believers are meant to clearly reveal Christ by their motives, words, and actions. How we live reflects his reputation. Put it another way. I've heard Christians say, well, I'm just going to leave Jesus on the corner. Then I'm going to go do something. Then I'll come back and pick him up later. Friend, you have tattooed on your forehead. I am a believer. And what you do and say and how you act and where your priorities are reflects on who you claim is your king and Lord. No, no, no. We're responsible, not just for what we say, but for what we live. Now, notice if you would where it says the spirit of the living God. Now, if you look at my, my it's kind of a long thing there, I know, but I need to go through it. The terminology referring to the triune God is very fluid. Now, what do I mean by that? In this chapter, we're going to call the Holy Spirit, the spirit of Jesus, and we're going to call the Holy Spirit, the spirit of the, of the Father. Now, I don't know how dogmatic to get on that. There is a real fluidity in the New Testament between the person of the Holy Spirit and the person of Jesus. Uh, I've done a special topic called Jesus and the Spirit, where I try to show you they have the same names. They, they have the same characteristics. They have the same uh, things they want to do for believers. And they're very close to Jesus, as a matter of fact. It is the spirit that brings to mind all the thing that Jesus said. It's the it's the spirit going back to John chapter 16, verse eight, that convicts the world and helps the believer become more like Christ. So all of these things are caught up in the spirit of the living God. I want to say a word about living God for a minute. Um, the idea of living God, God is the only one who has life. He is the only one who is immortal or eternal. And he. Um, Trusting Jesus is the way we become immortal or eternal. 
So I do, I do not think Adam and Eve were created um, eternal. As a matter of fact, you think about it, they were driven out of the Garden of Eden, lest in their sinful state, they eat of the tree of life and that problem state become permanent. No, no, no. I think it's a gift of God. Now, the word, the Old Testament covenant title for God from the Hebrew verb to be, and it's first found in Genesis 2, 4, and it's we think it's pronounced Yahweh. We're not sure because the Jews would not pronounce it. Now, in your in your English Bibles, whenever you have all capital Lord, that's where the word Yahweh appears in the text. And I would characterize it as I am the ever living, only living God from the Hebrew verb to be, which is explained. I am that I am in Exodus 3.14. So you might want to look at the special topic called Names for Deity, number D. And that's where I deal with, with Yahweh. Okay, let me see then. Uh, then it, it says, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of the human heart. Now, of course, we're, we're making a play on Exodus 31.18, and we're making a play on uh, Jeremiah 31.33. And this is where these two covenants are contrasted. One is an external external law that the Jews were never able to keep. Just, just look at Romans 15, where the Jerusalem Council admits that. Um, and then we have this internal motivation, which is, if you let me characterize Ezekiel 36, verses 22 through 36, I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to give you a new mind. I'm going to take your heart of flesh, uh, get a heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. So this newness, this newness of the new covenant is a gift from God to eternally motivate Christ likeness. And I want to say again, the goal of Christianity is not heaven when you die, but there are two goals for the mature Christian here and now. Number one is daily Christ likeness. And number two is the health and growth of the body. Christianity is corporate, not individual focused. And that's where the Western church has really got off by what's in it for me. What do I like? Do I have to personally receive? We are saved to serve and we are saved to serve the family. And once we catch that, a lot of these Western, I think, bad theology points fall away. Now, the next paragraph is in chapter three, verses four through six. I want to remind you again, the smallest part of scripture you should ever try to interpret is the paragraph. Paragraphs, they're not marked either in Hebrew or Greek, but they are a group of sentences around one topic. And those group of sentences have one major truth. And as a Bible interpreter, I tell people, do not get caught up in the details. Don't get caught up in all the what ifs. What is the main truth of the paragraph? That is what the Bible is trying to communicate, and God is not trying to answer all of our curiosity and questions about the details, some of which are lost in the first century, some of which are lost in Koine Greek, and some of, some of them are just not our business or relate to our culture. Okay, now the word confidence, this is a word that uh, comes from the same root as faith. This is a, a form of pistis or pistuo, and it is used a lot by Paul. And what I've done in your notes, and I'm not going to take time to go over this, but you can see it here. Paul uses it in a positive sense, and Paul uses it in a negative sense. So what we have here is uh, this idea of confidence or reliability. Human beings rely on some things that they shouldn't, and they should be encouraged to rely on other things. So I hope you'll check off those and look up those verse, individual verses and see how Paul uses that word confidence. Now, verse five, we are not adequate in ourselves. Now, I want to remind you, I almost got tearful last week uh, in trying to comment on chapter two, verse 16. As a preacher, I, you know, I pray and I study, but I never know who's there on a given Sunday or in a given Bible study. I know there are hurting people and people with unique needs, and I'm preaching on something else. I've got to trust that the Holy Spirit is going to speak to people's hearts in ways that I don't fully understand. How many times after a sermon has somebody come up to me and said, I'm so glad you said, and I go, I never said that. I never, <laughs> the Spirit was speaking to them, I guess. So what we have to say is that none of us feel adequate. Paul, did, who am I? 
to share the eternal gospel with somebody? Who am I to be the channel of revelation to somebody? None of us can stand that pressure. But the reason we can is because God has equipped us. God has called us. God has mandated we share who he is with others. And he is the one who has equipped us to do it. So I feel inadequate, but in him, I am adequate. And you can see the different verses I've mentioned there, and I hope you'll look them up. Now, the word to consider, uh, this is a form of logazomai, which means think clearly about. Now, what we're supposed to think about is the things of the gospel. So we are to think logically through these different issues. What Paul is telling this church is, think what you're believing. Uh, consider what you're hearing. Notice from whom you're hearing it. Check these things out, church. And I think that'd be a good word for us today. Um, I've listed several things for you there. Uh, I, I don't think I'll go through time to do that. But um, this may be the background that some of these, uh, quote, intellectual, either Jews from Palestine or possibly some of the Greek rhetorical people, kind of like the, the combination of Jew and, and Greek philosophers in the, as the heresy of Colossians. So Paul is thinking, think, think through uh, what you hear and why. The other thing I would say here is you and I need to be able to give an account of the hope that's in us to someone who asks. Now, that's the first Peter 315. I need to understand the gospel enough that I can share with my children. I always get tickled as a pastor. People call me to come share the gospel with their children. You mean as an adult who's grown up in the church, you cannot share the gospel with your own children? You got to have the pastor come? Have I got some official stamp that I put on them or something? We need to think through the faith enough to be willing to communicate to others, particularly when they ask, particularly at a time of crisis, particularly at a time of need. Now, you and I have a responsibility to worship God with our minds as well as other aspects of our being. Okay, I'll leave that then. Uh, as servants of the new covenant, that's uh, verse six. Um, this newness, I think, is going back to Jeremiah 31, particularly 31 through 33. Not the letter of the law, but of the spirit. Now, here's a series of comparisons. Uh, I've tried to characterize them for you here, but as you read through this, you ought to pick this up, These, this contrast. Here's one, what one brings, here's what the other brings. Uh, the written versus the spiritual, verses three and six. The letter versus the spirit, verse six. The old service versus spiritual service, verse seven. The service connected with condemnation, that's the Old Testament, versus the service connected with right standing. And that, a good parallel would be uh, verse nine. And what has passed away versus what is permanent. It, the Old Testament is passed away as far as a way of redeeming human beings. It never could. It never was meant to. It was meant to show us our sinfulness. Now, if you don't believe me, I hope you'll look at Galatians 3 particularly and Romans 7. Now, then it says, um, versus what is permanent. Now, that's verse 11. And then the veil remains unlifted. The Jews can hear and hear and hear, but not really hear. It's almost the curse of Isaiah 6, 9 and following. You'll, you'll speak to them, but they won't understand. You'll say something, but they won't hear. It, it's almost that Isaiah text versus um, what is permanent. Verse 11, the veil remains unlifted versus the veil is removed. Now, we would call this an evangelicalism, the aha moment when you recognize who you are, you recognize who God is, and you recognize what Christ has done for you. I mean, this is the aha moment. Of the, it's the great yes of from being lost and confused and lonely and frightened to being, oh my, what a, what a God this is, what a Savior this is. And that's when that wonderful peace comes. Now, notice if you would, where it says, the letter kills. Now, this is the primary purpose of the Mosaic law. I, I don't know if you buy that from me, but I hope you will read again carefully Romans 7, 9 through 11 and Galatians chapter 3. 
The purpose of the old covenant was to show us our sin. Now, isn't that exactly what the opening chapters of Romans 1 through 3 does? It makes all men sinful, whether it be immoral pagans, moral pagans, or Jews. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God and have that full list of Old Testament quotes about human sinfulness. Well, that's that's the idea. The law kills. Now, I've mentioned here, and I don't think you can see it in my notes clearly, but it's that second sentence. The law brings, number one, condemnation. The law brings wrath. The law brings death. And I've listed several books that have been real helpful to me. Now, this George Ladd, uh, this is a wonderful, I think, professor from, used to be at Fuller. He may be with the Lord now. But this book called New Testament Theology has been a real blessing to me. George Ladd, New Testament Theology. Okay, um, let's see. I marked in my note to read this sentence. So let me start when I begin with um, the relationship between the New Testament believer and the Old Testament law has been greatly has been a greatly confused issue. It seems to me, based on all the passages of the New Testament, that the Christian is not under Old Testament law. Now, I've given you several texts there, Acts 15, Romans 6, Galatians 5. This is not because the Old Testament has passed away. Matthew 5, 17 through 19, but because the New Testament Christian fulfills the Old Testament law in God's love relationship with us, seen in believers' love uh, for others. And I, there's so many texts on that. The purpose of the law is to bring fallen mankind to Christ so as to redeem them. However, just because the Old Testament is not a means of salvation does not mean it's not God's will for humans in society. So I, I hope you'll think through what I'm saying. I, in some sense, I depreciate the Old Testament. In other sense, I magnify its eternality. And that's, that's what I think Jesus does in Matthew 5, 17 through 19, where he says it's eternal, it's from God, it'll never pass away. And then it says, until all is fulfilled. And then beginning in Matthew 5, verse 21 through 48, it says in a series of little paragraphs, you have heard it said, but I say unto you, where Jesus corrects false rabbinical interpretation, where Jesus corrects the law of Moses over divorce. What they're showing is Jesus is the Lord of Scripture. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment. Uh, Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God. That's why we must review, relook, reanalyze the Old Testament through the eyes of the new instead of trying to interpret the New Testament through the eyes of the old, because Jesus is the ultimate and final revelation. Now, the next little item, the Spirit gives life. Now, I have heard this used to say, well, I don't prepare for sermons. I just pray and open the Bible and whatever the Spirit says. I, 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 I think this is not a hermeneutical view. It's a distinction between the purpose of the Old Testament and the purpose of the New. Don't take one little verse of Scripture and think you never have to pray or study. The Spirit will just give you the message. Oh, my goodness, that's just so naive. Now, the next paragraph is chapter 3, 7 through 11. Notice the if, but if the ministry of death. Now, this is a first class conditional sentence. I, I don't have time to go over this, but I want to say there is a special topic called Greek grammatical terms. In Roman numeral 7 of that, I give you all four Greek conditional sentences and what they mean. Now, this is not my opinion or your opinion. This is a Greek textual matter. Every one of these conditions has a particular textual form. The first class is assumed to be true, not to reality always, but in the purpose of the author's argument or presentation. So he's saying it is a ministry of death. The old covenant was a ministry of death, and that's why we've got to be careful of it. The ministry of death in letters engraved on stone. Now, this is a play from Exodus 34, where the, the Moses received the Ten Commandments in stone. Notice it came with glory. Yes, it did. But here's the whole point. The glory of the giving of the, of the law on Mount Sinai, Exodus 19 and 20, the glow on Moses' face, it diminished. The glow from the New Testament, the glow of the Spirit, the glow of Jesus, it does not diminish. Now, that's what Paul's trying to say in so many words through here. Um, 
Notice the contrast. Verse 9, it's a ministry of condemnation. What a shocking thing to say about two-thirds of our Bible. But the New Testament is the ministry of righteousness. Um, the old covenant could not save the children of Abraham. But the new covenant can save all the children of Adam. Okay. Um, Let's see. For indeed, what had glory in this case has not glory because the glory has surpassed it. Now, I know this is kind of confusing, but again, what I said a minute ago, this is a contrast between the glory that faded on Moses and the glory that never fades on Jesus. Um, let's see. Notice verse 11, which fades away. <laughs> uh, that which re remains is the, of the glory. This is all a play on that whole idea. Now, the next paragraph, verses 12 through 18. Therefore, having such a hope. Now, I've done a special topic on hope because Paul uses it in several different ways. In English, the word hope basically means maybe, could be, I wish it would happen. That is not at all what this Greek word means. The word hope is often used by Paul for the uh, assured events of the second coming, but the uncertain time element of the second coming. So hope is the consummation of the believer's faith. That's what it's always used. And if you look at the special topic that's on the screen, you can see all the details. Uh, we use great boldness in our speech. Now, this is the idea that they, they're adequate because the spirit flows through them. That's why they have this boldness. Now, verse 13, this verse refers back to verse 7, which is a play on Exodus 34. Moses' face faded, so does Moses' covenant. And then what we have here is, is again, a, a contrast between the old covenant and the new. Now, verse 14 is often called a lot of problems where it says, but their hearts were hardened. Now, this is aorist passive, which is a completed act done by an outside agent, not the subject. The, the Greek terms comes from the idea of being thick-skinned or calloused, unable to feel something because uh, you felt something so much you've grown used to it, or the skin has become callous where you can't. Now, there's several play people in the Bible who are said to harden. Now, God is said to harden people. I've done a special topic, God hardened. You might want to think of Pharaoh. You might want to think of Romans uh, 9 through 11, where God hardened, partial hardness come upon Israel. There are other texts that says Satan hardened. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the God of this world has blinded the eyes of the unbelieving. Oh, wow, scary. How can, how can Satan have that much power? And then number three, human, human origins. Sometimes humans just choose not to see, choose not to believe. It's almost like self-inflicted spiritual blindness. And sometimes it's done by human choice. Notice where it says the same veil remains unlifted. The Jewish people of Paul's day could not get it unless they were touched by the spirit and the veil removed. The Jewish people today can't get it unless they're touched by the spirit of God. And all of us are praying for the world to be touched. And so that the, the veil would be lifted from all who need to know Christ. Um. Let's see. Verse 16. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, the word turns here. Remember, the writers of the New Testament, they're writing in common Greek, uh, uh, business Greek, street Greek of the Mediterranean world. But these men, New Testament authors, except for Luke, are Hebrew or Aramaic thinkers writing in street Greek. So the way you find the meaning of Greek words is not go to the Greek poets. No, no, no. You go to the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint. And what this word is, is the word shub or the shub. Or it's, it's the word for repentance. So what it's talking about, whenever a person turns to the Lord, the implication is this aha moment. We turn from self, and we turn to God. Salvation is both a turning from and a turning to. And both elements are involved. And the ideal of turns, I think, uh, is a play on that. Now, verse 17. Now, the Lord is spirit. Now, this is one of those texts where I think this fluidity between the terminology for the Trinity is somewhat confusing when you want to be a nitpicking literalist and just say it says it right here and it's different. 
Friends, what we're saying is there's a close connection between Jesus and the Spirit. The Spirit brings to mind to the believer that they're sinful. I mean, to the unbeliever. The Spirit brings to mind the things that Jesus said to the believer. The purpose of the Spirit is magnifying the Son. The spotlight is never on himself. The spotlight is always on Jesus. So what we're talking about here is the veil being removed. And so the idea here is that the Lord that is Spirit is, and if this is the Lord that is Spirit, this is the only place in the whole Pauline epistles where the Spirit is designated by the term Lord. Now, sometimes God the Father is, and, but this is the only place the Spirit would be. I see. Sorry, my notes are... I got mixed up and put my little holes on both sides of the paper, so I can't tell where I am. Um, let's go to the next one. There is liberty. That's the next one in verse 17. Um, there's a freedom from spiritual blindness. There is a freedom from self-righteousness. There is a freedom from tradition. There is a freedom from legalism that comes with knowing Christ, the veil to this, uh, this human performance. And at this point, I always read again and again, Colossians 2, 13 through the end of the chapter, where Paul says, were you free from one form of legalism to be captured by another? Oh my, we, 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 Galatians. We didn't come to the Spirit with what we did. Why do we think we can be stay in the Spirit, be perfected in the Spirit by something we do? No, it is all of God. He removes the veil and he allows us to have this freedom. Now, again, please listen to me. The freedom in the gospel is freedom from and freedom to. We have a freedom not to be pulled by the flesh. We have a freedom not to be led astray. We have a freedom from that which is displeasing to God. But the freedom also says, now that we're free, we can serve him. And this is what I think freedom is. Now, I think there's a, I've met many Christians who I think take their liberty too far. And so I would like to mention a special topic called Christian freedom versus Christian responsibility which basically I take from Romans 14, 1 through Romans 15, 13, from the special topics of both those Roman chapters, and I turned them into a special topic, Christian freedom versus Christian responsibility. And I think what Paul would say is we're free now to love one another. We're free now to love our brother, and that's how we know we're in him. If the fall was a self-centered plan, Salvation is a him-centered plan. I think that is the bottom line here. Now, when it says, beholding in a mirror the glory of the Lord, I, I just want to read this because I'm not really sure I understand what this means. <laughs> Maybe you have better insight than I do. The gospel has fully revealed both Yahweh and Jesus of Nazareth, chapter 4, verse 6, as well as our own sinfulness. <laughs> um, we... As we respond in repentance and faith, the revelation changes us into his image. The same image is found in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. These Corinthian Christians had clearly seen God in Christ through the gospel. So this is not exactly how the book of James uses this concept of a mirror. Um, but I do think it's a play on this idea of image, which is used over and over and I, I made a note, a new note. It'll be in your set of notes that you get in, in about a month. But I wanted to kind of show you the different ways that Paul uses image to describe Jesus. I, I have a few, so just give me a minute. The image of his son, that's Romans 8, 29. The image of the heavenly, that's, that's 1 Corinthians 15, 49. The glory of the Lord into the same image. From glory to glory, 2 Corinthians 3.18. The image of God, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Uh, the image of the invisible God, Colossians 1.15. And some very similar phrases about this ideal of image. The only begotten of the Father, that's John 1.18. Uh, he existed in the form of God, Philippians 2.6. And he is the exact representation of his nature, Hebrews 1, 3. So this ideal is uh, to see Jesus is to see God. Uh, I think that's a powerful. How do I know what God's like when I see him loving the diseased, 
when I see him caring for women and children that society didn't, I see the heart of God. Clearly, clearly, clearly see the heart of God. Okay, the Lord, the Spirit. Now, I, I want to give you some possible translations here. I'm in verse 18, Charlie, and uh, down just, yeah, you, yeah, let's see. I want to give these translations because it's been difficult to know what the Greek here means. Here's King James. Even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Here's the Vulgate, Latin Vulgate. Even as from the Lord, parenthesis, who is, close parenthesis, the Spirit. Now, this is Westcott and Hort, the famous Greek. Um, well, they were like textual critics. Even as from the sovereign Spirit. Uh, so from context of verses 16 and 17, even as from the Lord, who is spirit. Now that's the TEV and the New Jerusalem Bible and the New International Version. It's hard in some context to know if pneuma, spirit, should have a little s, meaning the human spirit, or a capital S, meaning the Holy Spirit. And you just got to let context uh, kind of decide there. Okay, let's go to chapter four, if we could. I think it's another really interesting. Um, I've done kind of an outline in chapter four uh, to kind of uh, outline the chapter. You can see the different ways I think it's presented. But I, I think I want to just get into the uh, basic exegesis nuts and bolts instead of going through that. Now, the word we, uh, we never know what Paul means when he says we. Is this an editorial plural, meaning himself alone? Does it mean him and the other apostles? Does it mean him and his missionary team? Does it mean all believers? Now, I think you've got to take each one of these um, plural pronouns and see what the context is talking about. I think this probably, uh, it maybe it refers to Timothy and him. I'm just not sure, but it may just refer to him alone, meaning he has this ministry. And of course, what is Paul referring to? The ministry of the spirit, chapter three, verse eight. So, um, we have received mercy. Now, I want to tell you, I don't think Paul is a very good model for what we call uh, evangelical uh, witnessing today. If anybody was knocked off their feet and had didn't have much of a choice, it's Saul of Tarsus on the way to Damascus. I mean, God chose him to be an apostle of the Gentiles when he was an active enemy of the church. This is Jesus speaking to him, the resurrected Jesus speaking to him. And knowing Paul, <laughs> I think I do. The other apostles said, yes, we walked with Jesus. We were true apostles. And Paul would say, yeah, but I'm the only one of you that saw the resurrected Jesus. <laughs> nanny, nanny, boo, boo kind of stuff. So he received mercy. Uh, he was an anti-Christian, a gung-ho young Pharisee. And God had mercy here. I want to read that second paragraph that starts with Paul wrote. And just follow what I'm trying to say. Paul wrote in Greek, but thought in Hebrew. The Greek term for mercy, pity, or compassion is used in the Septuagint to tr translate the Hebrew word hesed. Now, hesed means God's covenant loyalty, God's faithfulness to his word, um, which relates to covenant fidelity. Yahweh is faithful to his covenant promises, even when humanity is not. Paul's dramatic conversion clearly reveals the compassion of God. For who? Jews. Militant Jews. Uh, atheists in, this, in some ways. Those who are enemies of God. God came to Paul and said, my power is going to pull you out of the mess you're in. Man, thank God for that. Um, <clears throat> let's see. I lost my place. I got so excited. Um, and to Gentiles, not only to Jews, but the Gentiles, Romans eleven thirty two, for his own covenant purposes, which is the restoration of his image in mankind through the work of Christ and the ministry of the spirit. God's loyalty to his covenant and his unchanging character is the is of mercy is mankind's only hope. Now, what do I mean by that? I would say the marker that we have been saved is that we have turned from the element of the fall, which is self-centeredness, to other-centeredness. God, what can I do to please you? God, what can I do for others? It is a marker that something really has happened to us. And I think God's unchanging, merciful character really is our only hope. Now, I've done a special topic called The Characteristic of Israel's God. Old Testament part of that, and it comes, it goes to Exodus 34, 6, which is the first time 
When Moses said, show me yourself, and God said, I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock, and he, the God and lift a series of his characteristics is what we hope in. He's merciful. He's compassionate. He's slow to anger. He's unchanging. Man, our hope is in the character of God. Now, when Paul says we do not lo lose heart, I, I want to talk about that for a minute. Because I think Paul did lose heart. And he lost heart several times. And so not, not only does the Jesus have to appear to him on the road to Damascus, which he records three times in the book of Acts, he had to Jesus had to appear to him several times more when Paul got discouraged. And one time he sent an angel to encourage Paul. Now, if you want the references, I think I've given them to you um, in the text. And there, there are several of them there. They're mostly in Acts. And the angel is in Acts 27, 24. So Paul did get discouraged. He said, we don't, but he did and had to have a supernatural pump up. Now, friends, I have never had a supernatural pump up. Those of us who, who know Jesus by the written word and by personal experience of faith, we're the ones that Jesus prayed for in John 17. Bless those who, who've never seen me. We know him by faith and by text and by what he's done in our lives and the lives of others. And so Paul said, I don't grow weary, but he did. And Jesus, because he's the apostle of the Gentiles, came to him in supernatural ways that maybe he doesn't come to us. Maybe he's come to you, and I wouldn't doubt that in a minute, but he never has come to me. Uh, we renounce, now in verse two, and this probably has to do with the methodology of the false teachers, something they did that Paul plays on. What he's saying is, we have renounced what? This kind of methodology. Now, what kind of methodology is it? No underhanded means, no disgraceful methods, no cunning, no tampering with or watering down God's message. Now, this reflects the false teacher. Paul says, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to give it to you plain, um, no coding, and the spirit will take it to your heart. So he's promising not to try to manipulate them. I must admit, I've been in churches where I felt manipulated, either to come down front to do something or to give more money or to have this kind of experience. Friends, we don't need to try to do, we don't need to psychologically manipulate people. We need to give the freedom to the Holy Spirit to work in our midst that doesn't quite follow our order of service. God help us. We need his presence in the modern church. Now, the things because of hidden shame, I, I would assume this referring to the false teachers, things that they did. We know from other places, uh, particularly uh, Second Peter and Jude, that there was sexual manipulation. There was drunkenness. There was all kind of uh, tricking people so the teachers would feel important. Man, I think I see that sometimes. We say to young, young students, if someone tells you God only speaks to them and they want your money and they want your wife and sexual freedom, run. I mean, those are the characteristic of false teachers, and that's who Paul's having to deal with. Notice where it says, not walking in craftiness. Now, walking is a biblical imagery for the Christian life. Um, walk worthy of the calling where you've been called, uh, Ephesians 4.1. Do not walk as the Gentiles walk, 4.15. Uh, walk in love just as Christ also loved you, Ephesians 5, 1, and on. That it, It's lifestyle. Now, what is the word for craftiness? Well, it must relate to the things at Corinth that Paul experienced in these house churches or false teachers. It's mentioned several times in 1 Corinthians 3, 19. It's mentioned in 2 Corinthians 4, 2, 11, 3, and 12, 16. Man, there was really tricky stuff. And you know what kills me is, Christians fall for it because they don't know their Bible and they're manipulated by powerful personalities. God have mercy on us. Adultering the word of God. Now, this is a word from the wine industry that meant watering down. Now, Paul's going to say, I, I don't change the word of God. Now, just, just for a minute, Paul does change his approach. If you look at his sermons and acts, he dealt with different groups in different ways. He used different illustrations, the illustrations they were familiar with. Yes, he changed the presentation. Yes, he changed the illustrations, but he never changed the basic gospel message. And that's what we got to do to different offices. If I'm preaching at an old folks home and I'm preaching at a college, I mean, there's a different way to present the truth. And I think that's what Paul did. Um, okay, let's look then. Um, 
Notice in, in where it says in verse two there, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Now, I just uh, I hope you'll circle that passage there. First Corinthians 9, 19 through 23. As an evangelist type, I have always been moved by that. For Paul says, I become all things to all men that by all means I might win some. No, he, he's willing when he's with Jews to keep the Jewish law, to preach the gospel. And he, when he with Gentile, he's ready to eat what they eat. Friends, the power is in the message of the gospel, not in the cultural aspects that we face. And so I, I hope you hear what that's saying. And then it says, in the sight of God, this is kind of an idiomatic parallel to God is my witness. He's saying, God knows my heart. God knows what I'm doing. God knows my motives. Now, the word if in verse three is another first class condition. If the gospel is veiled, and it is. Now, who is it? Ve well, um, <laughs> on these notes, obviously, when Paul preached, just think about that. If you're preachers or you're a teacher, you can tell when you look at an audience, this guy gets it. This one doesn't. And sometimes in an invitation, when the, the spirit is so present, why do some come forward and say yes to Jesus and some say no? It's it's a mystery. It's it's the paradox of election versus free will. It's the paradox that we don't understand. And Paul is struggling with that. And what he's saying is some people are just hardened. What are they hardened by? Well, we're we back to God. We're we back to Satan. Or what are we back to? Well, I think I missed my. Uh, my page there. OK. Uh, notice in, in chapter four, verse four, where it says the God of this world. Second Corinthians four, four. Let me see if I missed that. Forgive me, folks. My outline's kind of weird. OK, the gospel is veiled to those who are perishing. I, I'd like to say something here. I, 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 I don't know how you're going to receive it, but I, it's important to me as a teacher to, to tell you what I think and then give you the responsibility of checking it. Right. And I think you have the right to ask any teacher, can you show me in the Bible where you got that? I have been uh, convinced some that some of the standard views that I had about uh, hell. Uh, I'm in the process of changing some of my views. And I want to tell you that the two things that caused me to think through this that I was kind of ignorant of is two YouTube videos. And I, if you're interested in this, I hope you at least look before you throw something. One of them is by an Australian called, a judge, an Australian judge called Edward Fudge. And his YouTube video, video is called The Fire That Consumes. And what he does is take a biblical and historical approach to the three views of the early church about hell. I, I was somewhat ignorant of the early church. I'm an exegete. I don't do church history much. The other YouTube video was a, a teacher that I've recently become aware of that has theology very similar to mine. And his name is Steve Gregg. And uh, his YouTube video, G-R-E-G-G, -G, is called The Three Christian Views of Hell. And uh, I guess what shocked me, and Miss, <laughs> I'm not going to chase this rabbit long. John 3.16, one of my favorite verses. I mean, as an evangelist and a Great Commission Christian, I mean, John 3.16 is precious to me. Thank, thank with me for, again for the first time with a different set of glasses. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believeth in him should not what? Perish but have everlasting life. This is the word perished used again. Now, the word perish is used in different ways in different sentences, and you've got to check how it's used. Um, it's, been, it's been intellectually challenging to me to think through of some of these things that I've always heard, but maybe never looked at the early church some. So I challenge you to check those out and just email me and tell me what you think. The God of this world. Now, this is personal evil. And Paul has several names for this personal evil. And if you look in the notes, I've listed them there. Satan, the devil, the prince and the power of the air, the God of this age or world, so we're in Ionos, the tempter, the evil one, and an angel of light. Paul describes this one. 
Now, I do not know the source of evil. I do not believe that Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 are talking about Satan. I believe they're talking about the king of Tyre and the king of Babylon. So I do not know if Satan is an angel that rebelled or whatever. But I do know there's a personal force of evil that wants to hurt God by hurting that which God loves. And so it is this evil tempter. And what is the God of this earl trying to do? Well, notice it's the God of this. It's the word world or age. It kind of depends. The same thing is at the end of Matthew. I'm with you to the end of the age, to the end of the world, either way you want to put it. I think this reflects the two Jewish ages. I think there are two current. The Bible understood one age in the Old Testament. It started with God creating and God wanting fellowship at the fall in Genesis 3. And then God's going to break into human history with this Messiah and set up an age of righteousness. God's going to fix the mess of Adam and Eve. That's the promise. Now, what we know from the New Testament, this new age of righteousness called the age of the spirit, there has been an overlapping of those two ages. I think the, in the Bible, the word last days, um, the end times, the day of the Lord is talking about this period between the first coming and the second coming. And it's the overlapping. We often call it, it's one of Garden Fee's famous statements, the already but the not yet tension of the New Testament. Example, I have eternal life, but my body's still dying. I have been forgiven from the power of sin, yet I still sin. This is that terrible condition that human beings, even unveiled human beings, are still having. And so I, I think that's what this is talking about. Um, I mentioned here, if you look at the second paragraph, it is difficult to balance human unbelief, divine hardening, and satanic blinding. Oh, my goodness. I don't know how to do that. I would say that repentance in some text is a gift from God. And repentance is some text of a mandatory requirement of human beings trusting Christ. Well, is it of God or is it of man? Now, for me, this is where the concept of covenant has been so helpful to me. The eternal sovereign God who made human beings like himself for fellowship, he has set a covenant. And that covenant is his doing. He set the boundaries. He made the stipulations. But one of those stipulations is that his follow, his creation made in his image, initially and continually respond to him in repentance and faith. I, I usually say there are, quali there are conditions to the new covenant. Repentance, faith, obedience, service, worship, perseverance. I mean, the New Testament has, what would you call it? <laughs> Yokes, <laughs> going back to the, the idiom from rabbinical Judaism. So I, I think with, well, that's what we're talking about here. The mind has blinded the minds of the unbeliever. I have done a special topic called God Hardened. I hope you'll look at that. I have done a special topic called election predestination and the need for a theological balance. Uh, I am not a Calvinist. I am Arminian. So I'll just tell you right which side of the equation I'm coming to. But I certainly start my theology with the God who can do what he wants to do and a God who is in total control of his own world. So I hope you'll think through that with me. Um, I noticed this little notice is, can you imagine the power of the evil one that he is able to blind the eyes of humans to the compelling beauty of the gospel, to the wooing of the Holy Spirit. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. What kind of power does evil have? That is scary. Um, notice in the next little phrase, I'm giving you several English translations, so that they may not see the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ. Now, there's a play on light through this whole little context here. And so notice with me, Jesus is often called light, mostly in John. Possibly Paul's experience on the road to Damascus. Remember Acts 9, a bright light shone on him. 
and possibly an allusion to the Shekinah glory of the Exodus experience, because many of these passages are going back to the Exodus experience of Moses. Now, I've done a special topic on the Shekinah, which is this cloud of glory that represented the presence of God. In this context, Jesus is the new Shekinah. He is this, the, the symbol of God's presence with us. He is Emmanuel. He is the glory of God in human form, incarnated human form. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the little phrase where it says, who is the image of God? I've listed all those things earlier, the different way Paul uses the image of God. To see Jesus is to see the Father. Now, I've noticed in your notes, I've said the purpose of the incarnational purpose of Jesus, I think, was to fulfill three tasks. Number one, to truly and ultimately and eternally reveal the Father. Number two, to die for sin. We owed a debt we couldn't pay. Substitutionary atonement, Isaiah 53, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Mark 10, 45. And then to give believers an example to follow. Um, he didn't just die for us. Now he showed us what man should be, could be, one day will be. We ought to live. Christ's likeness is the goal of salvation. Uh, I, hope, I hope you can hear me on that. Verse five, we do not preach ourselves. Now he was, he was <laughs> attacked about this. Um, they were saying he's not a truly an apostle. He wants money and on and on and on. And Paul has to defend himself. Now, when it says Jesus Christ is Lord, I believe this is the early church profession of faith at baptism. I've given you an extensive outline there on the, the background meaning to the different words, Christ, Jesus, and Lord. If you're interested in that, I've covered it many times, and I'm not going to cover it again today. Um, there are several early confessions. And what do I mean by confessions? These are statements that people would make as a believer that others would recognize as an, a doctrinal affirmation. Let me give a couple of those. Jesus is the Messiah. You can see the long list there. If you go down just a little bit more, Charlie, in the outline, it's there, I think. Yeah, there it is. Uh, Jesus is the Son of God, and Jesus is Lord. Now, I've done a special topic called the kerygma of the early church. Now, kerygma is the Greek word to preach or proclaim. And this is my thought. If I want to see how the apostles shared the gospel with different groups, particularly Peter, Stephen, and Paul, the, the sermons and acts are to very much different groups, some, some Jewish, some Greek. What is the basic things they say about you? Give me a list of what they say and what they don't say. And as I compare those lists, I begin to see what the crucial elements of the gospel are. And you'll be surprised what's in there, and you'll be surprised what's not in there. <laughs> so I hope you'll look at that. I, I was The other day I was listening to one of these guys on TV, and they said, Peter and Paul in Acts sermons never mention heaven and hell as a motivation to trust Christ. Man, that'll make you think. They never mentioned that? In the kerygma of Acts? Woo! I got to check that out. I got to think through that. Now, let's see here. Okay. For God who said, light shall shone out of darkness. Now, this may be Genesis 1, 3. Or this may be Isaiah 9 about the people in Galilee will see a great light. I'm not sure what the Old Testament reference is, but they're going to see the glory of God. This is that Shekinah cloud in the face of Christ. And that's, that's the key. Christ is the physical manifestation of the invisible God. Now, the next set of paragraphs is chapter 7 through 12. Excuse me, chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. We have this treasure. Now, what we're talking about is the indwelling Holy Spirit here, obviously. In earthen vessels, we're talking about an emphasis on the frailty of the human body. And then it says we're all afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Now, verses 8 through 10 are a series of nine present passive participles. And they're going to contrast. They're going to they're going to. This is something happens. This is the consequences. Oh, it's a list of things to me. When I look at Paul, chapter 4, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, and 11, describe his ministry. I, I gripe about the air conditioner and how thick the pads are on the pews, and there's a baby crying in the back, and the sound system's not loud enough. Golly, we're spoiled Western Christians. 
I mean, Paul paid a real price. Rejection by his own. Hunger. Uh, uh, all kind of disasters. Paul says, I carry in my body the marks of serving Jesus. We, are, we live in Disneyland in gripe. Holy moly. When you see what Paul went through in this. Now, I don't think I'm going to go through each one of these uh, individually, but I, I hope you'll take a peek. And um, yeah, I wanted to pick up on verse seven for a minute. This will be in your new set of notes. I thought it was interesting. Notice it says, Paul speaks of his current physical body in several ways. Now, listen to the way he characterizes his body. These are New Testament images for the human person. It's an earthly vessel. It's an outer man. It's an earthly tent. It's a natural body. It's a living soul. It's from the earth, earthly, and, it, and possibly the old man. Now, all of this is talking about the human person and uh, several different ways um, that I think he tried to talk about that. Let's see now. Okay, I'm, I'm getting to where I want to try to move on through this. Uh, verse 11, we who live are constantly being libered over to death for Christ's sake. Now, I have three verses that I want to give you and I want you to look up after. And this, these are the three verses. I think that believers are trophies of the grace of God to demonstrate to the angelic world and the unbelieving world the merciful character of God. So let me give you these verses. Hope you'll write them down or I think they're in my notes. 1 Corinthians 4, 9, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, and Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. We are on display. When the angels who try to understand what God's doing with fallen humans and don't, when they see God's compassion for us, I think they say there's hope for themselves. I think it's powerful. Uh Notice verse 13, having the same spirit of faith. Now, the word spirit here is not capitalized in my translation. We're not talking about the Holy Spirit here. We're talking about a person's faith, a person who trusts Christ, a person who exercises faith. That's what we're talking about. Uh, notice in verse 13, according to what is written, this is a perfect passive verbal form, which is characteristic. It is the textual marker when they're talking about scripture. Scripture is that which was given by God, passive voice, and it a, has a permanent result. That's the perfect tense. And that's what that's talking about. Who raised Jesus from the dead. Now, if you notice in my notes, I want to quickly mention to you that all three persons of the Trinity are involved in all the acts of redemption. Just real quickly. In Genesis 1, we've got God the Father in the beginning God, Elohim. We've got the Spirit of God in verse 2, brooded over the waters. And from New Testament passages, it's Jesus who was God's agent in creation. So Jesus is involved in creation. Now, we say, what about here when we talk about being indwelt? We're indwelt by the Spirit. That's Romans, I believe it's 8.26. We're indwelt by Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory, that kind of one. And of course, it's the Father. And that's, I believe it's John 14, 23. All three persons of the Trinity indwell us. So if I ask the question, which one of the Trinity raised Jesus from the dead? Again, all three persons are involved. Please look at the notes here. God the Father, and that's the normal, that's the most common. It's like God raising the Son from the dead was God's way of saying, I affirm who you are, what you did, what you said. It's kind of like the baptism and transfiguration. This is my beloved Son. I'm well pleased in him. It's that kind of idea. God the Son raised himself, particularly that not only John 2, but John 10. I lay down my life and I pick it up again. I think J Jesus says that three times. And then, of course, the very common one is the Spirit raised Jesus, which is Romans 8, 11. All right. Um, let the next little phrase, will raise us, will present us. Now, this is talking about, these are soon compounds in Koine Greek. We're, we are raised with Jesus. <laughs> it's a wonderful text in Colossians, on, I mean, in Ephesians on that. And we'll be presented with all believers before the Father. This is the um, 
Matthew 25, Revelation 20 judgment scenes. So what we have here is this idea of being with him. Now, the, the understand the second coming. There are several different Greek terms that are used for the second coming. I've done a special topic called terms for the second coming, if you want to see all of them. I believe there's going to be a second coming. Now, the question is, did Paul believe he'd be alive when it happened? Or did Paul believe he'd be dead? Now, if you'll look at those verses I've given you, don't take my word for this. Holy moly, don't do that. Look, there are places where Paul says he expected to be alive. And there are places where Paul expected to be dead. Now, some theologians say Paul changed his theology. Oh, yuck. I certainly don't agree with that. The trick is, we don't know the time of our death. We don't know the time of the second coming. We believe it's going to occur. What, the second coming and our death are both going to occur. We don't have a clue about the time of the circumstances. So it's best to be prepared. In verse 15, Paul's heart was to help sinful people come to, and I have three lists here, come to faith in Christ, find true peace and joy, and give God praise. And look at the text that back that up. I think it's it's a powerful one. Okay. Verse 16, therefore do not lose heart. You look at the notes on, back at chapter four, verse one, where Paul did lose heart over and over. <laughs> Our outer man is decaying, but the inner man is being renewed. Now this is the idea of physical life is tough for believers here, but the things we go through causes us to grow. Now I've done a special topic called Christian Growth where I've listed four different passages in the New Testament where suffering is involved in the steps of us becoming what God wants us to be. I've done a special topic called Why Do Christians Suffer? I hope you'll look at both of those, Christian growth and why do Christians suffer, to try to talk about this question. A day by day, that's a Hebrew idiom. Remember, these are Hebrew thinkers writing in Koine Greek. Now, verses 17 and 18, look, look what I've said, and I hope you'll check me on this. Verse 17 is very similar to Romans 8, 18, while verse 18 is very similar to Romans 8, 24. Now, I think if you'll, you, you realize that when Paul wrote Romans, he was in Corinth. So you see how these books relate. Okay, now that's the end of that. I'd like to try to get through the, the next few verses of chapter five, if you will turn with me, and then I'll certainly give you time to talk to me. Let's go through the uh, special topics first where I can summarize all of the things. Um, usually at this point, um, people say to me, Bob, we just got to get up and go to the bathroom. And so I tell you what, let's just take a break for five minutes you can get a drink of water, do what you need to, and we'll be right back. Okay, five minutes. Let me give you a couple of uh, just housekeeping. Okay, we're going to try to do the first few verses of chapter five. Um, this book has 13 chapters. I'm trying to get through it in five sessions, which means I'm going zoom, zoom, and vroom, vroom. So I hope you have your notes. It helps to follow that. I want to look at these uh, contextual insights to chapter five. For me, this chapter has some of the most exciting things anywhere in the New Testament. I just love this chapter. I bet I've preached on this chapter just dozens of times. It's, it's so powerful to me. Now, first of all, Paul's going to discuss his death using two images. Now, he was a tent. We're not sure what Paul did. If he worked in leather or he worked in uh, other uh, other made saddles or something. We're not sure of that word, but we do know he repaired them probably. So he had seen worn out tents. And so he's going to use a worn out tent to talk about his earthly body, which is so beat up, we found from the earlier chapter. He's going to characteristically talk about putting on clothes and taking off clothes that symbol symbolize things in the Christian's life, that sin to take off, uh, God's glory and righteousness and will to put on. So he's going to use that those two images. Now, it is difficult to follow his antecedent thoughts. Where is he getting this from? Well, number one, our being clothed with Christ at baptism. That's one possibility. Or number two, the spirits indwelling at salvation. That's another one. Are receiving a new spiritual body at Christ's return. Now, it's obvious the context is in suffering back from chapter four, and we're going to hear it again in chapter six. So somehow this, his body is beat up, it's bruised, it, it's wounded, and he's having to deal with that. 
Now, number B, he makes, a, I think, a theological assertion here that's not really found anywhere else in the New Testament. And so what is he saying? Well, he's going to say, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Um, <clears throat> you know, originally, everybody in the Old Testament thought when you die, you go to a place called Sheol. And in the New Testament, the word for Sheol is translated Hades, the unseen realm. So everybody was expected to go there. But remember when Jesus and the thief on the cross and he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. But Jesus didn't go to paradise for 40 more days. The Jews came up with the idea that, that this Hades is split into two sides, paradise and to Taurus, the righteous side and the unrighteous side. So we, we wonder if this is a part of this deal. I think when Jesus came out of the grave, he took the righteous part with him to heaven. So when you and I die now, we do not go to the holding place of the dead. Some part of us goes to be with the Lord. Well, that brings another problem theologically. Does that mean that there is a disembodied state implied in New Testament passages? Uh, we're with the Lord, but it's not a full fellowship until the second coming. So does that mean <laughs> that I see my loved ones at death? I, I, I don't think we can answer that. Um, I think there's limited fellowship and we go directly to be with him instead of going to the grave is where the unbelievers go to this holding place. Now, if you want more information about that, I hate to do this to you, but these these topics are so involved in so many texts. I just can't do it in a short time like this. The special topic is called Where Are the Dead? And I, I deal with Sheol, Hades, Gehenna and Tartarus. Uh, then I talk about heaven. So I hope if you're interested in where are the dead and how, what these biblical words mean, that you'll look at that special topic. The next one I want to talk about, number C, is in verse 10. This also is something that I think is rather unique. And that is this. We will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, brothers and sisters, this book is written to believers. So is this referring to some kind of judgment for believers? Now, either is talking about something like the great white throne where God deals with both unbelievers and believers, or it's talking about a, a unique uh, judgment seat for believers. And I keep thinking as a person who knows my Bible, if my sin is forgiven, Jesus Christ's blood cleanses me from all sin. What am I going to be judged for by Christ? Now, this is not Bible. This is Bob. The only thing I can think about is my availability the use of my spiritual gifts, my willingness to share my faith, and my use of my resources for the kingdom. Now, am I going to be, am I going to be held responsible for my Christian life? Well, I think there is degrees of both punishment and rewards. Again, it's a special topic called degrees of punishment and rewards, where I try to show you that on both sides. There, there are gradations of this. And that may be what the judgment seat of Christ is all about. I, I'm not sure, but I, I think it's it's interesting to speculate on that. So with that in mind, let's get into the text itself. Now, we know, and I've talked to you about the amb ambiguity of this pronoun, and I'm not sure I know exactly who Paul is talking about. Notice it says, if, this is a third class conditional. Now, notice what he's saying. For we know if, now the if here doesn't mean since, or because, it means maybe. <laughs> it's a condition. It's a possible fulfillment, maybe a probable fulfillment. If, meaning if I die or don't die, that, that's the deal. If this tent is tore down, that's what he's talking about. Um, the word tent here, of course, is using for the frailty of the human body, is torn down. That's another word. It's a passive. It's a subjunctive torn down by God or torn down by time or torn down by evil one. Uh, but it is something that's going to happen to us. We have a building from God. About the minute I heard that, I, I thought of that wonderful text in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, a city whose builder and maker is God. We got this portable tent, like the tabernacle, portable. And David wanted to build a permanent house. Well, this is the same idea. I got this tent, this frailty. But one day I'm going to have a permanent building built with God without human hands. Now we're talking about the resurrection body here. 
uh, eternal in the heavens. Now, that surprises me some, because I would say to you, I hope you'll think what I'm saying and check me out biblically. I don't think we're going to heaven. No, I think heaven is coming back down to a recreated earth. Earth. Think of the end of Revelation. I saw New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven as a bride adorned. So I think the recreation and repopulation of the Garden of Eden, a recreated earth, the second Peter passage about the cleansing of the earth. And so I think we're going to be on the earth. I think this earth is beautiful and was created as a place for us to fellowship with God. So I, I think we got to rethink this idea about us going to heaven instead of heaven coming to us. Now, the word groan here, that was interesting to me in, in uh, chapter five, verse two. And I just want to mention to you some of the places in the Bible it talks about groaning. Now, this famous text that I'm thinking about is Romans eight, where in Romans eight, 19, it says creation groans until the revealing of the sons of God. And then it says that um, um, <clears throat> believers groan for their new bodies. That's rep Romans eight, 23 through 25. And also 2 Corinthians 5, 2 through 4. And then the Spirit intercedes with groanings uh, for suffering believers. That's Romans 8, 26 and 27. So there's some groaning going on in the human realm, in the spiritual realm. This is not the world that God intended it to be. This may be the best way to the world God intends it to be. But this is, this is not the world that God intended it to be. Now, in verse three and four, here's the imagery of put on. Um, <clears throat> again, is this is this uh, uh, talking about the disembodied state? You can see I've done rather an extensive little note there. I hope you'll look at that. This is a um, rabbinical idea of taking on and putting off as elements of, of a, the spiritual life. And this is imagery that Paul uses often. It may be new terminology of when someone was baptized, they gave them new white clothes to wear. So maybe Paul is picking up on Christian baptism imagery. Now, the word naked, this is in Greek literature. This means a disembodied state. Now, I want to remind you, the problem with the disembodied state is it's Greek, not Hebrew. The Hebrew thought is we are a soul. The body is the outward boundary of our soul. We're a unity. We'll always have a physical body in eternity. Now, that is the Jewish view and the Christian view. But what we have here is the time between the first coming and the second coming, the time between death and, and the resurrection day. So is that a disembodied, a partial fellowship? Think, think of the uh, rapture text in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Those who uh, uh, are alive and remain will be caught up. The ones who are dead will already get their bodies when Jesus comes. And those who are alive will get their new bodies and meet him in the air. So is that is that the time we get our new resurrection body at the second coming? Or do we get it at death? See, there's the question we just can't answer. It may surprise you. The Bible is very ambiguous on the afterlife. It's very ambiguous about heaven or hell. It's very ambiguous about the spiritual realm, the angelic realm, the demonic realm. We have a lot more curiosity in the Bible gives us information about. Now, verse four, this is a brief Christic reference, must be interpreted in light of Romans 8, 18 through 25. This idea of groaning, uh, the mortal will be swallowed up. So th this is uh, one of those texts. Now, chapter five, verse five, prepared. Um, <clears throat> our lives are not controlled by luck, chance, fate, but by God. Even our trials can be means of maturity and greater faith. The giving of the spirit is, now think what I'm saying, the sign of the new age has dawned, evidence of personal salvation, a means of ministry, a means of maturity, and the assurance and certainty of heaven. So that's what we're prepared for. The word pledge here, this has the Old Testament antecedent. I've given you the verses there in the Old Testament where it could mean different things. In Greek, it basically meant earnest money or a down payment on something. Or in modern Greek, it means an engagement ring. So it's a partial payment now with the promise of a full payment in the future. And that's what the spirit is, a partial payment now, but with the hope of abundance and of complete fulfillment in the future. Uh, okay, let's see. Okay, verse uh, 6 through 10, I'm going to stop there and then give you a chance to talk to me. 
Verse seven, we walk by faith and not by sight. That is a recurrent theme in the New Testament. I've given you the other verses. The word walk is, of course, a biblical metaphor for lifestyle. Uh, verse eight, I want to read, please. This is such a wonderful verse for Christians. It asserts that we will be with the Lord in some sense at death. This refutes the concept of soul sleep. Although our fellowship with other believers is uncertain at this stage, and our fellowship with the Lord is not all that it will be after we receive our new bodies on Resurrection Day, the great confidence is that we will be with him. This truth is not clearly caught elsewhere in the Bible, except possibly Philippians 1, 21 through 23, which makes this a very significant verse. In light of this truth, Paul and all believers can face any and every circumstance in life. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, verse 9, we also have as our ambition to be pleasing to him. Isn't that the motivation for Christians for everything? Uh, don't I pray that when I do Bible studies and when I try to help people? Lord, I want to be pleasing to you. I don't even always know what's pleasing to him except through scripture and the leadings or prompting of the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like when someone on the side of the road asks for money or someone knocks on my door at my office. I'd rather give them money and be tricked than somehow miss being a compassionate person in Jesus' name and that being God's will of sending that person to me. So I don't always know what's pleasing, but I do know from the, the Bible and the Spirit was not, and I can tell quite often what is. According to that which he has done, whether good or bad. Now, this is what bothers people, this universal principle of we reap what we sow. I've made a list, and you can see a partial list on your sign, but I, there's a bigger list than that. If you go down a little bit further, Charlie, you see it's the next one down. There's even a bigger list than that. If you'll go to Galatians 6, 7, I've tried to give the full list there. Now, this, this principle is we're going to give an account to God for the gift of life. Now, if we're believers, we hope that our sin is going to be forgotten and forgiven. I do believe when God forgives, God forgets. I mean, I, I had the text <laughs> for that, and I do believe that, but I believe we're still going to give an account. And this has something to do with the rewards for believers and, and the degrees of punishment for unbelievers. So uh, this is a universal principle mentioned in the Old Testament and New and I hope you'll look at the Galatians 6, 7 through 10 for the full list. All right. I think um, that's pretty much as far as I wanted to go tonight. So I've gone about an hour and a half. I know you all get weary and well-doing. Uh, brothers and sisters, what I try to do is stir you up to think. I, I do not want you to agree with me. And you need to check me. I mean, really, I, I'm I'm growing, too. I I Changed my mind on what I think about what I said about the Christian views of hell. And I've had to change my mind on some things about the, the date for the fulfillment of Matthew 24. I'm, I'm kind of leaning toward a partial preterist at this point. Uh, new information, new thoughts have caused me to think through this. I hope you're still rethinking. Uh, I usually tell my, my church when I preach, if you haven't had a new spiritual thought, thought about God in five years, you're brain dead. We're all in process. We're all growing. None of us have arrived. So what I'm trying to do is challenge you with what? Biblical information, how this word is used, these other texts that must be brought into. How does this doctrine affect this doctrine? Because remember, doctrines are not stars. They're constellations where doctrines impact each other. And I don't think we think through that. And quite often, we just believe what we've been given by parents or pastor or denomination. And we've got to think through that biblically. And when we do, there's going to be a real peace on our part. And it's also going to be an understanding on your part. So at this point, I'd be happy to try to clarify or give you a chance to say what you think. Or uh, you can ask me a question about anything I've said tonight or last week, too, about Corinthians. So Vidal, if you'll take over now. Uh, yeah, Dr. Bob, as I um, give you uh, some of the questions, written questions that we had come in uh, throughout the evening, I want to remind everyone, uh, get ready to open your mics if you choose to open the mic. I'd love to see your face as well if you choose to open your camera. You don't have to. Uh, but uh, le let's just begin with the written questions. And then again, if you guys have a question, you want to open your mic, please, by all means, or maybe a follow-up question from the 
one that you're about to see on the screen. Dr. Bob, this first one has to do with, um, uh, you said Old Testament did not save the children. This is back at the beginning. Uh, children of Israel, New Testament did. And that is because Jesus fulfilled the scriptures. Uh, yes. And of course, the trick is, here's the point. The covenant of Moses never could bring salvation because Israel could never be obedient because of the fall. So what we have is the new covenant. And so what the Old Testament couldn't do, the New Testament does. Now, people always say to me, where do you get that? Well, let me let me try to give you that. First of all, I get it from Acts 15, which is the Jerusalem Council. Then I get it from Galatians 3 and the book, primarily the book of Hebrews. So what we have here is a comparison of the old covenant and the new. They couldn't keep the old covenant, Acts 15, so why put it on the Gentiles? And this is where my special topic on Paul's view of the Mosaic law really comes in. In some ways, it's still true, it's still eternal, it's still the word of God. It functions in morality. It does not function in salvation. So I would say that Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment. He is the true temple. He's the new covenant. He's the incarnation and rev of the revelation of the invisible God. Okay, second question, Dr. Bob. Um with reference to chapter 4, 4, verse 4, could the author be referring to a specific kind of people as unbelieving, bearing in mind that at some point we were all unbelievers? Will they ever become believers? Well, that's a great question. Um, I think the hope of our gospel presentation is that when we preach or share, we never know what's in the heart of our hearers, right? And what this is, this is like pulling back the spiritual veil. And it says to us when we preach and we share, the reason some don't respond is that there is a spiritual influence at work. Now, to me, this is very similar to the parable of the soils. The seed is the gospel. It falls on four kind of soils, which is kind of symbolic of the hearts of different hearers. Uh, some uh, respond quickly, but fade away. Some can't respond because the birds get the seed. Uh, some respond, but problems and pressures kill the plant. And the way we know it's true is fruit bearing. It doesn't matter how much, but fruit bearing. So I would say when I share with somebody and you know, think, of, think of how radically lost Paul was. I mean, he is a militant. I think he killed Christians. I think he imprisoned Christians and the light broke through to him. So even though I think somebody is an atheist and a militant anti-Christian, sometimes things we say in love can be the crack in the dam that the spirit uses to get this person to an aha moment where their real fear about themselves and the future and their inadequacies can break through. So my job is to share the seed. God's job is to bring it to fruition. And I don't understand all that's involved in that. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, next question. Um, from 3.9. Um, I like to understand at what point the old covenant became condemnation to men. Is it from when it was given or from the establishment of the new covenant? Yes, I, I wish I could answer that. I mean, I, I don't think I can. I think I think the history of Israel probably is a clue. There's always been a faithful remnant within national Israel. But there's always been a terrible, unbelieving element. Even the kings, some of the most godless people are Israeli kings of the line of the Messiah. So I think the old covenant proved to not be effective. It couldn't bring peace to the heart. And uh, the new covenant can. So the Old Testament failed in its ability to bring peace with God, but it did accomplish what it was meant to do. And that is to show man that we have no grounds of boasting before God. No one is going to say, God, you got a good deal when you got me. No, no, no. We're all reclamation projects. And the Old Testament is the way to show that. 
Now, I know this, a lot of this is caught up in dispensational understanding of the Old Testament and the nation of Israel. And uh, I realize that I am not a dispensationalist. I, I do believe that the New Testament is about Jesus and not about Israel. So I'm coming from a little different perspective. Um, I guess I, <clears throat> I don't quite know what to do with people who say that everything in the New Testament is about Israel because it seems so so untrue to me so folks is there any other comments or questions please uh this is the chance where you guys love to hear from you open your mics and let's let's just let's just hear from you good evening everybody thanks once again bob for um past the buff for what you're doing and fidel and the family i had a question um concerning when you mentioned about um why couldn't the Old Testament say that we were children of Abraham or the New Testament say we were children of Adam? Yeah. Or oh, I might have gotten mixed up. Could you um, bring a clearer understanding yeah. on that? I guess what I was trying to say is the Old Testament was never able to save the children of Abraham completely, right? There were always some right with God in the family. But in many ways, the vast majority of the family were never, never faithful followers of Yahweh. So I kind of made a play on the old covenant goes back to the seed of Abraham, but the New Testament goes back to the seeds of Adam. And the way I get that is I think Genesis 3.15 about the serpent and the woman. I think 3.15 of Genesis is a promise to humanity. And I don't think there is any nation of Israel until the call of Abraham in chapter 12. So I think God promised to redeem all humanity through Christ. And that's where I got the idea of the new covenant goes back to Adam, where the old covenant primarily goes back to Abraham. So maybe that was just me trying to be too cute. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Oh, thank you, Cleve. Good. It's good to have you, brother. Thank you for talking to me and for tuning in. Bless your heart. So, Dr. Bob, maybe part of the question or the comparison and the contrast between Old and New Covenant also speaks of the universality of the gospel, which you just explained going back to Genesis, mm -hmm. right? Redeeming humanity versus just an ethnic group. Yes, I think so. And, of course, um, I would see that primarily in Romans 9 through 11, that God called Israel to reveal himself, to bring the Messiah from this particular people. Uh, but that they miserably failed in helping the world come to know Yahweh. So Jesus is not plan B. It, Jesus has always been God's plan. And that's why I go back to Genesis 3.15. So I think e Israel was a true revelation, but a passing and fulfilled revelation. And I base that on Matthew 5, uh, 17 through 19. And then Jesus showing he is the true interpreter of you know, even the Old Testament in verses 21 through 48 of Matthew 5. So um, Gary and Carlos got questions for you, but before I turn the mic to you guys, let me just briefly um, do one quick thing before I forget, which is remind everybody or show everybody that some of this ex ex explanations or expanding on the explanations and the subjects are found, this is the website, freebiblecommentary.org, and they're found in this little uh, red button on the right, which is special topics or Bible dictionary. And this is the reference that Dr. Bob is making throughout the evening when the commentary gives you extra links and, and they're in alphabetical order. Um, so anyways, just keep that in mind. And this is where some of those explanations go into details. And Vidal, and, while we're talking about that, would you click on why for me, please? Because I think most of my presuppositions about the relationship between the new and the old is that Yahweh's eternal redemptive plan. Would you kick on that the third down? Now, brothers, this is my basic presupposition of how to view all of the Bible. And what I try to do is, is say it has always been God's plan to redeem humans made in his image. So I, if you want to kind of see you, see, you see where I'm coming from and see how I try to document what I believe. This is going to be a crucial special topic to see if you agree with my understanding. And what I hope I can do more than anything 
is challenge you about what you've always heard and show you there are other verses that don't quite fit what we've been told, which means that the Bible presents truth in paradoxes, and we're not used to that as Western people. And by the way, um, if you guys go back with me on this special topic, let me see if I can do that um, to go back. Um, let's see, here we go. Okay, this one in particular has, this is where I got it. This is where I got the special topic and it has a related video. So you're welcome to also watch the video where Dr. Bob expands on that as well. Okay, Brother Carlos. Yeah. Hi, this is awesome, by the way. Uh, only my second time uh, being on since I started last week. Thanks to Clyde for inviting me in. But um, the uh, so I, I guess just in and I would have my camera on, but I'm driving home and I'm still so. <laughs> um, but um, so it's almost like it just for me to get clarity of thought. The 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 um, the second covenant isn't like the backup plan. It's almost like. If God is the designer, God of design, it's the, the purpose of the first covenant was to bring about the second, which just led to the beginning of what, what he, when he initially had that redemptive promise with Adam and Eve. Is Brother, that, that is what I, that's what I believe. And I get that from those sermons in Acts, where particularly in the Pentecostal sermons, where, where Peter says this is the predetermined plan of God. There are four times in the first two sermons of Peter where he says, none of this is by accident. This is the purpose. I mean, Jesus came to die. He's the suffering servant. He's the wounded shepherd. Um, he's the one of Psalm 16. So what we're saying is that the Old Testament was and pointed to Jesus and that he is the fulfillment and overflower. So here, one more point. I think that what God did is Israel was meant to be a light to the world but they failed. And so what Jesus done is take the purpose of God. He has gone beyond national promises and made a universal redemption for all human beings. And what I say to people, and I hope you'll think what I'm saying, Carlos, thank you for asking. No New Testament apostle nor Jesus ever reaffirms a national promise to the nation of Israel. The New Testament is not about the nation of Israel. Now, thank God for Israel. But the New Testament is about Jesus. He is the fulfillment and universalizer of the promises to all human beings. And that's what that special topic, Yahweh's eternal redemptive plan, tries to document from both the Old Testament and the New. Thank you, Carlos. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for joining the class, and um, hoping you can join us next week as well. Gary. I'm here to stay, brother. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, talking about the covenant, uh, I was just thinking that the covenant to Israel, wasn't it a conditional covenant? Yes. And they didn't meet the conditions, so are they still his chosen people? Well, that's a great question, and and I'm going to have to haw, hem, haw, and crawl that a little bit. <laughs> I think there are Old Testament covenants that are absolutely unconditional. I think the promise not to flood the earth again is unconditional. I think Abraham in Genesis 15, I'm gonna, you're going to go into Egypt, but I'm going to bring you out in 400 years, is unconditional. I think the fact that God's going to send a Messiah through Judah, through David, unconditional. But I think most of the if-then part of the covenant is conditional. And um, the problem is that many people don't buy that conditional element. So I would say that, the, again, the special topic where I've tried to lay this out is the, is the special topic covenant. And to me, covenant is what solves the tension between God's sovereignty and human free will. And that's where the conditional nature comes in. And um, I think most of the covenants are conditional on a personal level and unconditional on a redemptive level. So I remember I did a chart one time in church. I had this overarching 
thing. And this is God's promise to redeem man. That's Genesis 3.15. Nothing's going to affect that. He's going to do that. Man's, man's in or out doesn't affect God's overall redemptive purpose. But me being involved in that purpose has to do with choices that I make in life. So this one's unconditional and this one's conditional. Uh, but it's terribly paradoxical to talk about that. And quite often the covenants don't have the if-then format, but it is implied. So. The other question I had, uh, you see any uh, differences or distinctions between being veiled and hardening of the heart? Hmm. I really think it's imagery about the same thing. And that is man's inability to really see what the Bible is about. Really, really a darkening of the understanding. Um, because if they understand, they're going to rush in, right? I mean, it's what a, wow, what a great deal. God loves us. Jesus died for us. We can be with him forever. We can have purpose. We can have sin forgiven. We can have joy. I mean, why would anybody say no? Well, it's this, it's this veil over the heart. And only the spirit can remove that. I don't think study can. I don't think effort can. It's a spiritual thing. That's why we say uh, quite often, this is where I think this is that tension. John 6, 44 and 65. No one comes out of the father unless the Holy Spirit draws them. I, God has to take the initiative. Now, here is my problem as an Arminian. Does God draw some? Or does God draw all? Now, my view of God being the savior of the world, John 3, 16, wishes that none should perish, tells me that somehow he touches all. Now, the mystery is, what about those who've never heard? I've come in my own personal life to say this. I trust in the character of a loving, merciful God. And though I don't understand about aborted children, and I don't understand about retarded people, and I don't understand about those who've never heard, I have no, no option but to leave them in the hand of a fair, loving, merciful, bend over backwards God. But I have no scriptural way to answer those questions. Thank you. And guys, your questions are very insightful. So we're always very appreciative of, of your interaction. And thank you so much. So you are more than welcome to continue to open the mic. We've got a few minutes before we finish our time tonight. Um, I guess one of the questions, Dr. Bobber, or thoughts that as I listen to, to the interaction tonight, I'm thinking of the God of covenants and, and just the fact that sometimes or most of the time we're so entitlement driven that we forget that just the fact that God has chosen to relate to us via covenants, that's just part of the grace of God. It is. In yeah. reality, you know, he shouldn't have to. But at the same time, and this is where I see the entitlement growing more or the self-sufficiency or whatever you want to call it. But the, the, the sacrifice of Jesus and the horror of the sacrifice of Jesus reminds me of the consequences of the breaking of those covenants. And, and when we're driven by entitlement, I think we obviously minimize the reality of sin or the reality of the transgressions against the holiness of God or the God of covenant. Therefore, we minimize, you know, we conveniently minimize. And, and um, uh, this is what I'm drawn uh, back to Genesis 15 and how God assumes the responsibility and says, you know, with Abraham, if you were to, if you were to uh, break this covenant, I'll take ownership of that, which eventually shows up on the cross. But anyways, I'm just I think another that. one, Vidal, that I, that's meaningful to me is the Ezekiel 36, 22 through 36, which says, I scattered you in the world so you can reveal pe me to people, but you've done a miserable job. Everywhere you've gone, all they've seen is my judgment, not my character. So I'm going to, I'm going, look at the number of eyes and uh, Ezekiel 36, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, you messed up terrible, so I'm going to do it. And this is where the new heart, new mind comes in. So God's going to give us this new heart, new mind, because we could not do it ourselves. We were incapable of doing it ourselves. So if, or since God has done that, would you also say that for us who are part of the new covenant, members of the new covenant, 
uh, we are more accountable of our behavior and when we choose to break those. Yeah. And I mean, I'm put, I usually put, I'm kind of a tacky person. So I put it this way. <laughs> you as a new Testament believer, you know more about God and his purposes than Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. You know more about God than any old Testament person. And what are you doing with it? That sense of accountability, the responsibility, right? Comes with the territory. Dr. Bob, a couple of more questions before I let you go tonight. Okay. Uh, they are on the screen for you. So I get the sense that you emphasized, speaking of tonight, Christ's likeness as the goal for salvation. If you could uh, explain or expand a little bit more on that. Sure. And the reason I think that is true is that the whole purpose of Israel was to show the world what God was truly like. Well, one of the purposes of being a Christian is to show the world what Jesus is fully like. So I think it's the evidence that I've been saved, that I'm no longer selfish, but now I think about the body. That's one evidence that the, the damage, the image damaged in the fall has now been restored where I can have intimate fellowship with God. And what that means is I want to do what's pleasing to him. So the call is for me to be like Christ. And the call is for me to help grow and serve his church, the body. So that is what I that is what I see the Christ like call. And I also think that we none of us make it, of course, all of us fail over and over. But if people see Jesus in us, they're going to be more likely to let hear what we say about the gospel. And I think the problem with much of the lost world is they see the terrible inconsistency, unlove, and bickering in the church. They don't see us as loving, forgiving people. They see us as um, combative and judgmental and self-righteous. And um, I, I think that's a real barrier. So I often say that Christianity can sometimes be a barrier instead of a bridge. And many of the churches I've been to, I have felt absolutely unwelcome. And it's always tickles me when I go to a church, nobody talks to me. They don't say, hello, good to have you. Do you live around here? And then when I get up to speak, they go, oh, hey, you are. Uh -huh. Once they realize who I am, then they want to be friendly. But that's not the way it works. If God found somebody found you when you were a miserable person and loved you and shared with you about Jesus. Man, we need to be that for somebody else, yeah? I think most churches are friendly, Dr. Bob, but they're friendly among themselves. And that's the issue that they get they confused because they are very friendly within their circle and their, you know, network of friends within the church. But the reality is that, yeah, uh, when, when you have people from outside the circle, probably it's not going to be the case. But yeah, you're right. Um, one more question, Dr. Bob. Uh, let's see. How do you, oh, how did the many prophetic texts speaking of the regathering re of all 12 tribes relate to the covenants, um, yeah. if at all they do? Well, I would say to you that I think that many of the, of the prophecies that we have were fulfilled when the Jews returned in 538 under Cyrus's the second decree. Uh, some of those prophetic texts were fulfilled then. And, uh, even the text about Daniel that we often talk about, Daniel 9, particularly 24 through 27, I, I think that's fulfilled in, in the life of Christ and not some future antichrist or something. So I think what, what's happened is in Western Christianity, this futuristic understanding of all these promises in the Old Testament, people say that it hadn't happened yet, so it's got to be in the future. Well, in my opinion, that's a totally misunderstanding of the nature of the of prophets. Just think of um, Jonah. He he preached, you're going to burn, Nineveh. He didn't preach, turn and burn, just burn. And they repented and God changed his mind. So prophecy was always saying, if you don't change, this is what's going to happen. But if they changed, then that prophecy became null and void. So a lot dispensationalism says all prophecies have to be literally fulfilled to Israel. I really disagree with that because I think that's a misunderstanding. First of all, what does literal mean? And second of all, how do we take this in the in the flow of history, particularly the Jews being back in the land? So I, I think that many of those have to do with that. 
And then the other side is, I think what Jesus did is overflow those national promises to all the world. So now uh, Jerusalem is not a, a city in Palestine in Revelation. It's New Jerusalem image for heaven. So what we've done is taken those Old Testament images and universalized them to all people. Now, again, if you want to see a special topic where I've just ripped my guts out over this, it's the introduction to Revelation called a crucial introduction to Revelation, where I try to show you why do the Old Testament promises to Israel seem so different from the New Testament promises? Well, I hope you will look at that special topic. Is that is that the the topic the the special topic crucial introductory articles to New Testament apocalyptic? Yes. Okay, that's I, I want to. It's also under the W's under why do Old Testament covenant promises seem so different than New Testament? So it's in two. It's got two titles. It's the same special topic. I'm going to put it on the chat, guys. So good. Uh, good. do that. So please. If you want to further the conversation? Uh, it's there. It's on the chat, so you can. And I use about six six items that have changed meaning in the New Testaments that relate to Israel. So I hope you'll check that and check me out. Don't take what I say. Look I was up. going to say that it, this is this is to engaging in a conversation, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. different views on that, but uh, we want to go and check on the scriptures. Gary, um, yeah. brother, Doctor Bob, I I know I should let you go, but I just uh, was thinking of Garden and V and the covenant of love or the New Testament. If you live in the covenant, my understanding with Garden and V, you have eternal life. It's a blessing. And if you're outside the covenant of love, you're cursed with death. Do I have yeah, the I, understanding that Garden and Fee has? Do you do you know what book Garden Fee said that in? Is that gospel and spirit? Inter no, that's interpreting it or the Bible for all of us. Oh, time. that that what what point exegesis, that one? Uh let's see. I can't I yeah. don't have it here right now, but it mm -hmm. I just remember in the covenant, you know, if you live in the covenant. You have the blessings, and the first one was life. And if you don't live in a covenant, you've got curse, and the first one is death. Yeah. This is uh, probably somewhere, I don't exactly know the context he said that, but this may be the ideal of what we call limited immortality, where those who don't believe are finally just annihilated, and those who do have everlasting mortality, or immortality. So, I think love is the marker for the Christian faith. I get that from 1 Corinthians 13 and 1 mm -hmm. John 4, particularly. And so don't tell me you love God and hate your brother. 1 John will call you a liar, right? So love is the marker that something has happened to our hard heart. And um, it is the evidence that we've met him. And it is the it is the crack in the in the dam of unbelievers when they see unconditional love it melts their heart and there's a chance to talk to them. Judgmentalism won't break that heart. Legalism won't break that heart, but love will. Love will break that heart. 